Hello, literature students. If you're watching this video, you probably have been assigned the Zora Neale Hurston short story, Sweat. We oftentimes go over this story in my introduction to literature class, and it's a good story uh, for analyzing elements of literature, but it's also a good story for analyzing social themes, which we generally do in our introduction to literature class in the thematic unit focused on race, class, and gender. And this story has all three elements of that. Um, and it also says much to us about the work coming out of the Harlem Renaissance, um, because this was published in the midst of that uh, that uh, program or that that sort of cultural uh, uh, manifestation of of this emphasis on on African American arts. And I want to share with you um, the actual text we're going to be looking at is from uh, the the issue of Fire, which was one of those publications that came out of the Harlem Renaissance uh, in the midst of, of all those folks we were talking about in our unit on Langston Hughes and, and others like that, that were promoting and, and putting forth these types of publications. And Zora Neale Hurston was very much in the midst of all of this. Um, and so uh, one, what are the questions we usually frame when we look at this story um, if we're looking at it from sort of a race, class, and gender perspective, is we might think about the structure of the story and the point of view that is set up. So in the discussion forum, I oftentimes will ask students, what is the, the, the point of view of this story? And oftentimes we'll read this story in combination with the Alice Walker um, short story, Everyday Use, and we'll sort of compare the narrative point of view of the two. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, compare the characters of Delia and Sykes. These are the two primary characters. I think we can say without doubt in this story, the protagonist is Delia. She's the one we're attached to. Um, and the narrative point of view is one of third person, limited omniscience. Uh, we do have access to Delia's um, thoughts, but we don't really have access to any of the other characters' thoughts. Uh, in fact, the men at the store kind of serve as a kind of chorus, and that's how we're able to get some of those perspectives out. So. Hurston is definitely following uh, the more contemporary uh, approach of using third person limited omniscience. Um, the story was published in 1926 in Fire Magazine, part of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, identify three objects, symbols, or devices that have added meaning in the story. Um, identify two passages in the text that relate to race, class, or gender. Uh, discuss these themes and how they affect the meaning of this text and explore the title of the story, okay? So let's, you did a great job in your forums. When students have done these forums, they oftentimes have really good insights, but let's talk a little bit about the actual structure of the story itself. So I just went over, the. it's in this third person narrative, and we wanna strike a few main points about the narrative. One is that it's set in this area of Florida that's based upon Eatonville, Florida, which is where Zora Neale Hurston did a lot of her anthropological research, a lot of her writing, and a lot of her folklore studies. This community was um, very much an isolated, or how do we put this? It was an enclave that was predominantly African-American, a predominantly Black community in Florida and fairly segregated. And so for that reason, when we address the question of race, class, and gender, Race is not so much a huge issue in this story. For readers, it is because the N-word is used repeatedly, but it's used by African-American characters in the context of the story, particularly the sort of evil character, Sykes, who has this domineering, abusive relationship over Delia. Um, and, uh, and within that context, actually, as students oftentimes point out in the forums, this is more of a story of class and upward mobility and, and, and things like that, um, in that Delia is forced in some ways, she makes her living and she's supporting Sykes and herself and keeping the house afloat by doing this laundry. Well, she's a domestic, so she's doing laundry for the white people in the nearby town, right? Sykes opposes this. So we have a little bit of discussion in the story about him being upset about her bringing the white people's laundry into their house, but mostly it just demonstrates him as an autocratic asshole of a husband, right? A domineering uh, husband. He's having an affair on Delia. She knows that he is. She's seeing that he's seeing this woman, Beulah. His intent is eventually to displace her from the house, which she basically bought. She's 
been making the payments on. She's been keeping the upkeep. She's the only thing that's worth anything in the story. And she's being persecuted, not by white society, but by her husband. Um, so it's an interesting sort of dynamic there. Um, and when we talk about, there's a couple of unique features that students oftentimes point to in the story. I ask you to consider uh, the, the title. Well, the title, it, it uh, makes sense right from the beginning. It was 11 o'clock on a spring night, 11 o'clock, and it was Sunday. After any other night, Delia Jones would have been in bed for two hours by this time, but she was a washwoman, and Monday morning meant a great deal to her. So she's doing all this hard work, sweat, sweat, sweat. She's sweating, and she's she's. you might go back all the way to A Rose for Emily, which we read early in the Elements of Literature class, where uh, the white character there talks about going to uh, the sharecropper managers to the Colonel to Spain. And he says, this is a white sweat. Um, this man wants to see us doing this white sweat, this white labor. And it's an equip. It, so it, it is complicated. It has to do with class, has to do with working class people, but it also has to do with race in this regard. Um, but she sweats and she works very hard. And this theme comes up later with the men at the store who described the story of Delia and Sykes, who started out, it seems, in a loving relationship, but then he's been so abusive and so terrible to her over the years, physically and mentally abusive, that he's been wearing her down, wearing her out, wringing the sweat from her, so to speak, or in the terminology they use, it's like a piece of sugar cane that you chew on and chew on to get all the sweet pulp out, and eventually you're just left with the dry husk. OK, so she was a sweet woman. She was a wonderful woman. Everybody in the community knows her, but she's been in this abusive relationship. And so the rest of the story takes us through this. Sykes were introduced to as a terrible person. Um, you ain't got no busy business doing it. God knows it's sin. Someday I'm going to drop dead from some of your foolishness. Another thing, where you been with my rig? I'd feed that opponent. My, uh, he ain't for you to be driving with no bullwhip. And so Sykes has teased his wife by coming in with a bullwhip and pretending it's a snake. It establishes the theme of snakes right away in the narrative. And we can talk about the symbolism there when we talk about some of the symbolism in the narrative. And um, here in this story, notice that they have the N-word sometimes bleeped out, which is kind of nice. Um, but he's using this aggressive language and he's talking about how aggravating it is, how skinny she is and how worn out she is. And we know that he has these designs on this woman, Delia, uh, uh, Bilia, Bila. And so there's this uh, scene and they almost get in this fight and, and she's, uh, she's putting up with his guff and she's got to do all this extra work and he's, being, he's making the clothes all dirty again. He's just a real jerk. And um, so we establish the conflict, the threat. He wants to take the house away from her. She knows he's off with this other woman. And... And, you know, it's only till later in the story that we realize her life is actually at risk because he has all these things that are that are uh, they're, they're sort of uh, um, very threatening. Um, and you'll notice there's language like this. Um, uh, she talks about going to a different church. We have the establishment of church and religion very forcefully early in the story. Um, and she. Uh, he stepped roughly upon the widest pile of things, kicking them helter-skelter. Sykes, you quit getting dirt on these clothes. How can I get through that uh, Saturday if I don't get through Sunday? I don't care if you never get through. Anyhow, I done promised God and a couple other men, I ain't gonna have it in my house, these white people's clothes. Uh, don't give me no lip either, else I'll throw them out and the, uh, put my fist upside your head to boot. Okay, now it's hard to, it's a little bit hard to read because of the dialect and, and Hurston was famous for using this very sort of heavy dialect and she's admired for being able to capture some of that southern Florida patois that that dialect that's going on there look Sykes you've gone too far I've been married to you 15 years I've been taken in Washington for 15 years sweat 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 work and sweat cry and sweat pray and sweat what's that got to do with me he asked brutally What's it got to do with you, Sykes? My tub of suds is filled your belly with vittles more time than your hands filled it. My sweat is done paid for this house, and I reckon I can keep on sweating in it. She seized the iron skillet from above the stove and struck a defensive post, which act surprised him greatly coming from her. It cowed him, and he did not strike her as he usually did. So what's going on here in this? Uh, she, she has her, her, her first sort of 
opportunity to, to fight back, so to speak. It, it includes the image of the fact that she's doing all this work to keep the house and to keep Sykes in you know health and, and prosperity. And he's taking care of her. And now he says, uh, uh, it cowed him and did not strike her. Nah, you won't, she panted. That old snaggle tooth, black woman you running with ain't coming here to pile up on my sweat and blood. You ain't paid for nothing on this place. And I'm going to stay right here till I'm toted out foot foremost. And he says, I hope that's what happens. But here's some wonderful irony. Once you've read the story, who's going to be toted out of that house foot, uh, foot first is Sykes at the end of the story when he gets bitten and killed by the snake in an act of poetic justice. The rest of this, look at this. She's she's going over her life and how she wound up in this this uh, case of domestic. So the story really has a lot more to do with gender issues and the abusive relationship of men to women. Um, she talks about how they started out in this romance, but then she's been turned into this rough specimen over the years, had all this sweat, had all her sweetness drained out of her. Somehow before she uh, came to sleep again, she found herself saying out loud, Oh, well, whatever goes over the devil's back has got to come under his belly sometime or another. Sykes, like everybody else, is going to reap his sowing. And so she believes very much in the gospel. She believes, and it sets up the theme here of redemption. So in the forums, when we're talking about sort of figurative language and double meaning, one of the major ones here is one of redemption. And we know that in African-American culture, there's a great deal of, of um, emphasis placed on redemption and placed on um, on these narratives of of um, of being freed. Um, sometimes this is referred to as liberation theology, and so it is bound up in this notion of being under the most arrest, the most extreme circumstances. These sorrow songs and these Negro spiritual so called that came out of the fields from slaves and the blues eventually and jazz. All that has its heart in what W.B. Du Bois would later characterize as sorrow songs. And so we know that this liberation theology, this Christianity, is very much wrapped up in her own redemption um, and what she's going to be doing uh, with, uh, with uh, her attempts to try and, and sort of be liberated here. Um, okay, I lost my, my screen sharing here. Hold on a second. I think I've got my screen back. So this one long paragraph here, though, it's important to remember, and I've stressed this before, but let's just repeat it. This is dealing with an abusive relationship, and it's it's focused on these gender issues, where we're told two months after their wedding, he starts beating her. And so she has put up with his stuff for a long time, and but she's a meek woman. She's an honest woman. She's a Christian woman. So she needs someone to help her, to redeem her. And let's see if this happens into the rest of the story. Perhaps the rest of the town could intervene, but we see that that's not the case as we enter, encounter the men at the store and uh, they're not gonna do anything. Um, this, uh, it's almost like a Greek chorus. Um, it was hot, hot near day, near the end of the July. The village men on Joe Clark's porch even chewed cane listlessly. They did not hurl the cane knots as usual. They let them dribble over the edges of the porch. Even conversation had collapsed under the heat. So, you know, this part of Florida, sugarcane country. Sugarcane, by the way, very much wrapped up in the slave trade. You know, Haiti and a lot of the Caribbean countries, they uh, became these plantations for sugarcane, uh, for both refined sugar and for rum and molasses. And so this industry supported and needed a lot of labor. And so a lot of, of Oceania, a lot of uh, the Caribbean, a lot of uh, the Southwest United States, our South, Southern United States is wrapped up in the sugarcane culture. And, you know, sugarcane, you can buy sugarcane sticks in the store occasionally. You can chew on these that, you know, that's what they derive the, the sugar from. They're sweet, but then obviously you chew the pulp out and the, the sweetness goes away. This is the metaphor that's used by the townspeople acting as a kind of uh, chorus when they see Delia walk by. They tell uh, any knocking, too much knocking around will make anybody, um, you know, lose their attractiveness, will make them look rough. Um, I swear that eight rock couldn't miss a sardine can of done throat out back the way uh, 
last year. She looks bad. Um, she's she's been abused so much. And how come Sykes is so mean to her? Well, he's into this fat woman, to use the language of the story, uh, Beulah. Um, he's uh, he's always coming around being a real jerk. Um, uh, he, he's just like such a, he, he, he's such a domineering character in the town. We have this kind of line from Clark, the store owner who kind of captures it. There ought to be a law about him, said Lindsay. He ain't fit to carry guts to a bear. Clark spoke for the first time. Taint no law on earth that can make a man be decent if it ain't in him. There's plenty of men that takes a wife like they do a joint of sugar cane. It's round, juicy, and sweet when they gets it, but they squeeze and grind, squeeze and grind, ring till they ring every drop of pleasure that's in them out. When they satisfied that they is wrung dry, they treat them just like they do a cane chew. They throws them away. And there's the symbolism is very ripe. It's because the cane chews are all on the porch all around them. Do, they knows what they's doing when they's at it and hates themselves for it, but they keeps on hanging after that till after her till she's empty. Then they hates her for being a cane chew in, in the way. We ought to take Scott and that stray old woman of his down to Lake Hall and Swamp and lay old rawhide on him. And they got all their sort of like, we're going to take care of this guy. We're going to really show him what's going on. And then he shows up. And what do they do? They don't do anything, right? Because, uh, you know, it's all comes down to Delia at the end. And if that's not bad enough, Sykes is using all the money that he gets from Delia to buy all these things for Delia and to say, I own this town, basically. And of course, the townspeople at the store do nothing. So Bertha had been in town for three months now. Delia is suffering under all this. And we have a couple of references here when we get in. We're going to wrap up our discussion here by taking a look at the ending. And what we're going to see is there is a lot of ripe symbolism here. Obviously, there's the symbolism of the title of sweat. There's the symbolism of the cane chew there. There's the, you know, this ask for this double meaning of this woman has been put upon, but the most potent imagery in it is Christian, the Christian imagery of redemption. And um, here's what, uh, to bring the, 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 the plot to a head here. Um, he, Sykes is out catting around with Beulah. He's doing terrible to Delia. Um, and uh, he still assured her that he was the swellest man in the state. Sure, you can have that little old house soon as I can get out of that woman out there. He's telling uh, Beulah, I got to get my woman out of this house. Everything belongs to me as sure can have it. I sure abominates a skinny woman. Lordy, you sure is one to have a portly shape on you. Now, we might ask ourselves, what's going on? Students often ask, what is going on with the skinny woman versus the portly woman sort of stuff? Beulah versus, uh, versus uh, Delia. There's a lot of discussion here about uh, appearance of, of the women in the story, very pejorative descriptions. All I can say is that cane chew metaphor and having all the juice squeezed out. Delia is this skinny, put upon uh, you know, woman, and, and she's been worn out, and, and Beulah is fleshy, and we understand that she's going to take over the house, and uh, and you know, it's just a opposite a contrasting view and this is what Sykes wants he wants a he doesn't want the skinny woman who he made like this cane chew all worn out he wants this fresher piece of flesh so to speak so we have this dynamic going on and then um Dilly comes home and we have the snake and the snake is introduced and Sykes is just as as big of a jerk as possible and she tries to reason with him and says um she says you know like I I just can't handle this anymore um, and he just doesn't care. And so we have a line here early that says, um, Dia and Sykes fought all the time now with no peaceful interludes. Dia's work, worn knees, crawled over the earth in Gethsemane um, and up the rocks of Calvary many, many times during these months. She avoided the villages and meeting places in her effort to be blind and deaf. But Bertha nullified this to a degree by coming to Delia's house to call Sykes out to her at the gate. Um, just awful stuff that's happening to Delia. Gethsemane is the uh, garden that was the scene of Jesus' arrest um, and a, a scene of suffering. 
And Calvary Hill outside Jerusalem is where Jesus was crucified. So if you're missing the point here of redemption, Delia is looking for someone to redeem her and is clearly closely aligned to a Christ-like image here. She's suffering. She's sweating. She's doing all this work. Who's going to redeem her? Well, the snake appears. Well, what's the snake symbolize? The snake symbolizes Satan. The snake symbolizes a creature of, of terror. The snake symbolizes something that is, um, you know, hard to pin down, uh, that's frightening to people. It's We know it's very frightening to Delia. The snake symbolizes and is a is an analog for Sykes. Sykes, snakes, they're both evil. The snake is obviously a potent image in the Bible. So all this Christian the theology and Christian themes coming in make a lot of sense here. Um, so here we go. This, uh, the, they, they have this battle over the snakes. Um, and, uh, and it was just too much for Delia. And she says, uh, Sykes poured out, uh, Sykes, I want you to take care of that snake from here. You done starved me and put me up into with, uh, put, and you done starved me and I put up with you. You done beat me and I took that, but you done killed all my insides, bringing that vomit here. Sykes poured out a saucer full of coffee and drank it deliberately before he answered here. A whole lot I care about how you feels inside or out. That snake ain't gonna do going no damn where till it gets till I gets ready for him to go. So far as beating is concerned, you ain't took near all that you're going to take if you stay around me. Delia pushed back her plate and got up from the table. I hate you, Sykes, she said calmly. I hates you to the same degree that I used to love you. And I done took and took till my belly is full up to my neck. That's the reason I got my letter from the church and moved my membership over to Woodbridge. So I don't have to take no sacrament with you. And I don't want to see you around me at all. Lay around with that fat woman all you wants to. But go on away from me in my house. I hate you like a suck egg dog. Sykes almost let the huge wad of cornbread and collard greens he was chewing fall out of his mouth in amazement. He had a hard time whipping himself up to the proper fury to try and answer Delia. Well, I'm glad you does hate me. I'm so tired of you hanging on to me. I don't want you. Look at your stringy old neck. Your raw bony legs and arms is enough to cut uh, cut a man to death. You look just like the devil's doll baby to me. You ain't. You can't hate me no worse than I hate you. I've been hating you for years. But she gives as good as she takes in this case, and she starts to have her first moments of, of resistance. And she says, you old black hide don't look nothing to me but a passel wrinkled up rubber and your big old ears flapping on each side like a pair of buzzard wings. Don't think I'm going to be running away from my, uh, my house either. I'm going to the white folks about you, my young man, this very next time you lay your hands on me. My cup is done run over. My cup runneth over. So the 23rd Psalm, we rely on God to redeem us. If you're a Christian, you think in my lowest moments, I, you know, I shall fear no evil. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God will redeem me. So all that my cup runneth over, I don't deserve it, but he will redeem me. All these sort of things are being wrapped up into this. She's, she's implied she's going to go to the white authorities now and, and complain about his abuse. Um, so she, this brings the story to a head. So now Sykes knows he has to do something. She goes off to Woodbridge to do her, uh, do her, her, her uh, church. And um, she comes back and she's singing this. So this brings us to the climax of the story. So just so we're all aware, she comes back. And while she's been gone, we piece together later. Sykes has been to the house. He knows it's going to be dark when she comes back. He puts the snake in her wash basket on her bed. So she comes back from church. We're back to the beginning of the story, very conveniently framed. Sunday night, she's got to do the clothing for Saturday. This is where the story started. But she, she, the lights are off. She can't get the lights on. She comes in and she's singing the song. And it, it, uh, it resonates with us um, because uh, she, uh, she has got this idea about being redeemed. So we learned that at the sermon service over uh, 
town over, they must have been singing the song about Jordan water. It's pronounced Jordan water. The River Jordan, where uh, Jesus was baptized, and we think about baptism as a kind of a redemption, and we think about the story of Jesus sacrificing himself for our own redemption and all those sort of things. So this is a very potent image, and she's singing this tune, and she comes to the door, and she doesn't hear the snake uh, writing up, and she says, what's the matter, old Satan, in case you missed the symbolism here? Um, but we know that the, uh, the snake is inside the house. Um, uh, 15 years of misery and suppression have brought Delia to a place where she would hope anything that looked towards away over or through the wall of inhibitions. She felt in the match safe, but Sykes is such a jerk. He's taken all the, the snot out, all the matches. Um, and he, she knows that, that Beale has been to the house, just misery upon misery. But then she, uh, she gets ready to start doing her laundry and she finds the snake and she's singing the hymn. I want to cross Jordan in the calm time she was singing the mood of the love fest had returned she threw back the lid of the basket almost gaily and there's the snake and so she goes running out and sykes had intended for the snake to bite and kill her but instead now the snake is loose in the house so this is the most beautiful poetic justice you've ever read this asshole sykes associated with the snake himself comes back she's up in the hay mouse. she's so put upon it she says I tried. There's nothing I can do anymore. I got to leave. He wins, but he goes there and she's, she wakes up and she sees him. She wakes up because he's breaking up the, the, the cage for the snake because he believes that the snake is inside having killed De Delia. And he's going to go in there and get the house and give it to Beulah and all that sort of stuff. But that's not what happened, right? She says, I've done the best I could and God knows it ain't my fault. I'm going to have to give up now. But now she crawls down from the hay mow. Uh, the gray in the sky was spreading. Delia descended without fear now, and crouched beneath the low bedroom window. And he's saying, Sykes is in there hoping to find her dead body. That old scratch has woke up now. Um, she mused at the tremendous whir inside, which every woodsman knows is one of the sound illusions. The rattlers of ventriloquist. So she sets up, the author sets up this thing where Sykes doesn't really know where the snake is in the house. Um, and so inside, Sykes heard nothing until he knocked a pot lid off the stove while trying to reach behind the match safe in the dark. He, he being an asshole, had taken all the matches, so there's no matches. Uh, the snake seemed to wake up under the stove, and Sykes made a quick leap into the bedroom. Uh, he thought the snake was in the kitchen, but it's a ventriloquist, we're told. So the snake is still on the bed. He goes into the bedroom. If I can only struck the light, the rattling ceased for a moment as he stood paralyzed, he waited. And listen, we do not like Sykes. He's got something coming to him and we're meant to understand it's redemption from the Lord in a certain, certain poetic justice at the very least. So now he's in trouble. Ah, for delight. He'd be, uh, I thought I'd be too sick. Sykes was muttering to himself when the word began again closer, right under his foot this time. Long before this, Sykes' ability to think had been flattened down the primitive instinct and he leaped onto the bed where the snake is. Outside, Delia heard a cry that might have come from a maddened chimpanzee, a stricken gorilla, all the terror, all the horror, all the rage that man could possibly express without a recognizable human sound, a tremendous stir inside there, another series of animal screams, the intermittent whir of the reptile, the shade torn violently down from the window, letting in the red dawn, a huge brown hand seizing the window stick, the great doll blows upon the wooden floor, punctuating the gibberish of sound long after the rattle of the snake had abruptly subsided. All this Delia could see and hear from her place beneath the window, and it made her ill. She crept over to the four o'clocks and stretched herself out on the cool earth to recover. Now, isn't that a great description from outside the window? Hurston is so great here. We have to imagine what's going on inside, and the poetic justice and the redemption just keeps continuing on because he pulls the, the stick out of the window to kill the snake. So now Delia doesn't have to worry about the snake. And we find out very shortly that the snake has bit Sykes in the face. Perfect. He's starting, his face is starting to swell. His mouth is starting to swell shut. It couldn't be more perfect. She lay there, Delia, Delia, Delia. She could hear Sykes calling in a most desperate tone as one who expected no answer. The sun crept on up and he called. Delia could not move. Her legs were gone flabby. She never moved. He called. The sun kept rising. My God, she heard him moan. 
my God from heaven. Irony, my God from heaven. She heard him stumbling about and got up from her flower bed. The sun was growing warm. As she approached the door, she heard him call out, hopefully, Delia, is that you I hear? Okay, then this brings us to the final paragraph. This is really quite interesting the way that uh, Hurston has set this up. And again, the symbolism here very much is one of redemption. God has come or some power or poetic justice has come to redeem her. She didn't have to kill Sykes. His own terrible actions have led to his downfall, right? So his sin is being punished to a certain extent. And all this religious imagery here is intentional. She saw him on his hands, his knees, as soon as she reached the door. He crept an inch or two toward her, all that she was able, and she, all that he was able, and she saw his horribly swollen neck and his one open eye shining with hope. A surge of pity, too strong to support, bore her away from that eye that must, could not, fail to see the tubs. Well, what does that mean? He must know now that she had been home earlier and that the snake had gotten out and she left the snake in there. And so he must know now that she didn't set the trap, but she certainly is not his redeemer here, right? Um, he would see the lamp. Orlando with its doctors was too far. She could scarcely reach the chinaberry tree where she waited in the growing heat while inside she knew the cold river was creeping up and up to extinguish that eye, which must know by now that she knew, right? That she knew what? And so students are oftentimes debating what's going on there. But um, the fact is that, uh, that he knows that he's, why should she help him? He, he got himself in this circumstance through his terrible actions. He was trying to kill her. She's a good Christian woman. She feels remorse, but she had nothing to do with this. All she did was open the laundry hamper that was intended to kill her. And when she looks at him at his final moments, what I think Hurston is trying to capture is that she has been redeemed. God has intervened. She didn't have to do violence to Sykes, but he needs out of the picture. He's a terrible person. And this is poetic justice. And uh, and he knows in his final moments on earth that she's not going to help him. There's nothing she can really do, and she's not going to help him. Why should she help him? So that's uh, that's a summary and response to Sweat. I hope that it was helpful to take a look at some of that uh, extra imagery. And I appreciate your attention to the assignments that were related to this reading.